So good evening. My name is uh, Dr. Catherine Gitao. I'm a psychiatrist um, and I'll be your, the moderator for this evening. Um, we are just waiting for a few attendees to join us so that we can start the session for today. So once again, welcome to uh, KMA, KPA, CPAC, NANAC, uh, KCOA um, webinars that are uh, dealing with mental health issues. Uh, I have lost count of how many webinars we have had so far, but uh, feel most welcome. This evening we'll be talking about uh, dealing with children with disabilities uh, and neurodevelopmental issues in the time of COVID-19, uh, which is quite an important topic because uh, some of us either have children with disabilities in our homes or even see them in our practices. So uh, this will, will be taken through this by Dr. Felicita, who I will introduce much later. With us, we have quite a number of panelists. We have uh, Dr. Edith Koba. We have um, Elizabeth, I mean, yeah, Elizabeth, uh, I call her Liz, so I sometimes forget her full name. So Liz Kaemba, let me just call her by the names I'm used to. She's a clinical psychologist, has been practicing for quite a number of years and her specialization is in, in adolescent and child mental health. 
And uh, we also have Yvonne Orlando, who is a clinical psychologist here with us this evening. We have Rachel Miner, also a clinical psychologist. I uh, had mentioned Dr. Edith Koba, who is a psychiatrist. We have Dr. Ohas Josephine, who is in the panel, but uh, today she's in, just in the background. Uh, and uh, we have quite a number of KMA uh, leaders, uh, leaders with us. And I'll ask one of them to just say hello and welcome all the members. I'll just pick on uh, Dr. Amos Otara. Maybe you can just say hello and welcome members for the webinar this evening. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good evening and welcome to the webinar today. Um, I'm sure this, as she says, uh, we don't, we've lost count of the number of mental health webinars we've had, but that does not say we've had enough. We are determined to go through this process entirely during this COVID era. And on behalf of Senior Medical Association, I think I just want to welcome you all. I hope uh, we've enjoyed the presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. And without... Uh wasting too much time, I'll introduce Dr. Felicita Mwangi, who is a consultant psychiatrist and a research fellow with special interest in child and adolescent mental health uh, and uh, developmental psychiatry and neuropsychiatry and neuropsychiatric genetics. So Dr. Felicita will take us through the session this evening. Karibu sana, Dr. Ri. Dr. Felicita. Felicita doesn't look like he's in the online. She's dropped off. Uh, yeah, Since maybe she just left. Give her a call okay. and uh, okay. try to reconnect her. Okay. Dr. Haas. Uh, we all need to talk. Okay. Yeah. Meanwhile, uh, Liz Kaimba, maybe you can just uh, give a short intro on your experience so far with uh, children with disabilities and neurodevelopmental issues in these COVID times as we wait for our presenter. You can just maybe give us a few words. Um, well, thank you. It's an important topic um, we have today, especially um, talking about the burden on children of, of COVID on children, and especially ch um, children with um, disability. Um, and we, what I had prepared basically is just to discuss um, the various phases of, uh, of COVID so far and um, maybe how it has affected these children. Um, and I found a paper where they actually uh, talked of the three phases of the pandemic, which is the uh, preparation phase. This at this point is where there was a lot of social distancing and shutdown and measures of hygiene were very stringent. Um, I remember in Kenya and many other places there, were, there was a great amount of panic. And this is the time schools closed and we brought our children home. Um, phase two was the, or what is what they call the, the maximum phase where we are now in the house and the curve is reaching towards his, its uh, highest uh, where the new cases and the mortality rates are peaking um, including maybe for other countries a plateau phase i think in kenya now we've we are kind of we have kind of crossed over that phase and then the phase three which is maybe where we are looking at shortly is the recovery from the pandemic and returning to the new normal where we reorganize and reestablish services and practices and I was looking at these faces and I was thinking about the impact 
on children uh, of, of these phases of COVID. And um, we find that um, at the very beginning, um, when the lockdown was put in place, where children were pulled out of school and there was a lot of disruption, um, children, especially children with disability, um, we pulled them out of their basic services where skin, um, they were in school, kindergarten, where they received routine medical care, which was kind of no longer available, and the impact that that may have had on them. Uh, from a mental health uh, perspective, the stress, the fear, the fear with which they fed off, um, their parents, um, etc. that um, must have been really uh, hard on them. And uh, then during the lockdown or, or the second phase, where now uh, we are kind of getting used to the fact that um, there's no more leisure activities, there's no more um, uh, interacting with peers, uh, medical services are limited, etc. Um, we find that uh, again, there is that really impact where social relations are strongly limited. The children have stayed up home for a while and um, there is a bit of discomfort. If there was no stigma uh, when the child was in school, we find now stigma from um, the neighbors, maybe from the people who live in the home. Uh, these children, remember, they, they need a lot of care. Some of them, especially those with... Uh, like uh, autism spectrum disorders, children with ADHD, uh, children who suffer CP, um, we, we find that they need a lot of care. Now they are permanently home. We find um, some parents who are actually not equipped um, to generalize some of the strategies that the school is using at home. And these children become, um, quote unquote, a burden on them and they find that they cannot be able to cope. Um, so what generally happens then is um, children may be exposed to abuse, children may be exposed to all sorts of, of, of mistreatment, um, sometimes um, maybe from the middle class and the lower class, the houses are very small, you know, so and everybody is home all the time. Uh, the children do not have an opportunity to go out and play. So this um, has really impacted them and of course posed some severe uh, threats to their mental health. Um, um, Dr. Felicity, when you're ready, please tell me so I can let you continue so I don't um, hijack your, your presentation. So uh, again, I think during the final stage or third phase of, of uh, COVID, we find that um, there is a economic recession where a lot of people lost their jobs, um, children have been home, um, people are, are no longer maybe able to sustain or support. And we find that um, this economic hardship um, brings with it a lot of other stressors and a lot of other things. For example, uh, one of the major, major effects would be even domestic violence where um, the parents are no longer able to provide as they should. And um, some of this impact of the stress can be taken out on the child. So, or, or some of the mental health issues that come about with, uh, with quarantine um, would be like depression, low mood, irritability, and these stressors also impact uh, the child uh, or the children in the home. Um, the resources being limited also has its own impact where maybe uh, the children are not able to, to receive the kind of uh, healthcare or um, even support, even maybe something as basic as food that they were previously used to getting. So um, there are mental health difficulties that really have come about with COVID. And I think uh, our presenter is here now and uh, she can take over, then maybe I'll come in at the end of the presentation. Doctor. Okay, thank you very much, Liz. Uh, kindly, Dr. Felicita, you can take it from here. Yes, um, I'm trying to share my screen. I had to move my 
uh, the presentation to Google Drive so that I'm able to share because I'm using a Mac and it's a bit, it's, it's just going to take me a moment okay. to share my content. Wow. It's, it's it's a bit complicated sharing from here. Why don't you try and just mm. present without sharing the presentation? You can send it on email to one of you and then you screen for you project. Okay. Send on email to Yeah. Uh, to one of you. Uh, um, can you send it to Dr. Let Kate? me send it to one of us, then they try and share. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's much easier. I can send to Dr. I'm sending you my email. Let me just type it in the chat. Uh, what's Text me her mail. I will send it right uh, now. Uh, okay, she's she's uh, she's sending. Uh, Doctor Gitau is sending you her email. Eh? Okay. So that you can send it to her. So she'll move the slides for you. On the on the chat, she can send them on the chat. Yeah, yeah. She'll send the email on the chat, and then now you'll you'll send her you'll you'll send her the the presentation, and then she'll 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 move the slides for you from her end. Okay, and, and as she does that, I, I just want to share my thoughts, just one minute about the parents. And I just want to, uh, I don't know, to, to thank all the parents who have ch children with the neurodevelopmental disorders. It's been very tough for us general parents with patients who are well, having to stay with them in the home for this long. And, and sometimes just being in school, it's always a good time for the mother to also breathe, breathe in. So we want to send our love to all the mothers who have neuro children with neurodevelopmental disorders. And if you have a sister or a loved one who has such a challenge, keep supporting them. It is not easy. With our you normal know, children who we can give instructions, we struggle. You can imagine for the other children who are used to routine, like an autistic child. And, and, and this period, they don't have they are not able to keep to that routine and maybe it's a nurse or a doctor or whoever it is, a healthcare worker. And now you have to really struggle to let this child get into a new routine. Our love goes to all these mothers and we, we salute you for everything you do to them. I think that's what I wanted to say. I always see these children when you see them in the clinic and it's always, you can see mothers struggle. Now you can imagine when there's such a prolonged duration. So yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say. As we try to as we try to sort this out, uh, Liz, you can just uh, please go on with the presentation, or alternatively, uh, yeah, kindly. Okay. Um, well, yeah, let's talk about um, the phase maybe at which we are currently. Um, we find that um, right now maybe we are at the phase where we are beginning to go back to our old. Um, system schools may be reopening soon um, and we are trying now to reorganize and reestablish um, whatever we have lost or um, during this return to the new normal phase yeah 
so we find um, that um, just getting these children back to school, um, getting them back to their way of life, there are so many losses that um, they have had. Uh, they have been exposed to several things, some good, like a lot of family time where the family is loving and, and very accommodating. Um, but now they have to go back to their peers. Some, of course, have also been exposed to increased family com conflict. Some, as we have seen, even in our country, have been exposed to abuse. Um, and other mental health issues, that, other issues that affect their mental health. So we find getting them back um, to um, the new normal may be a lot more difficult. Uh, we know that um, as mental health specialists, even now, especially us who work with children, we have actually seen a fair, uh, for me personally, I've seen a bit of an upsurge in um, psychological cases where children need help, need intervention. So um, we don't know, we know that um, there is more to come once um, the pandemic is over and um, things start getting back uh, to the new normal. And I'm seeing the presentation is on the screen. So I think uh, I'll let uh, Dr. Felicity continue. Is that okay, Catherine? Yes, that's okay. Kindly, Dr. Felicita, go ahead and thank you very much, Liz. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys, my gadget is uh, a bit complicated and uh, I apologize for the delay. So, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Mwangi Felicita. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about dealing with children with uh, neurodevelopmental issues, uh, be it the disorders or just uh, disabilities. Um, it's a very wide topic, so I'm going to try and do a little bit of a summary. Next slide. So I'm going to, to define some simple terms that that come across when you talk about uh, developmental disorders or development. Then uh, we look at a little bit at some terms that are used that we come across during the presentation. Uh, I'll do a little bit of introduction. Then I'll just simply list some of the commonest neurodevelopmental disorders without going into a lot of details. We can discuss that a little bit further during the discussion time and have some questions about it because it's more about how we address them rather than you, you know defining these disorders they can be many they can be wide and then we will look at a, a bit of uh, strategies um, that we can use to address uh, these children and their families during especially specifically during this time of covid but also um, generally how we can address these uh, problems. Um, and then finally, I'll, I'll, I'll do a small summary and a conclusion. Next. So the main term that will come across today is the word development. And then we will come across the word neurodevelopment. So simply by English definition, uh, development is just a process of growth. Uh, progression, change, um, that brings about physical, economic, environmental, and social uh, changes that th these are the main components that we are thinking about when we talk about development. So people will talk about um, physical development, people will talk about economic development, environmental development, social uh, development, and during our discussion here, development shall encompass uh, all of these um, domains. Then we have neurodevelopmental disorders. What are these? These are just disabilities in the functioning of the brain. So neuro is brain that usually will affect a child development or 
growth and progress and positive change in the domains we have described above, physical, economic, environmental, and social. And they include many disorders, but the commonest one that comes to mind usually will be mental retardation, which is actually now called intellectual disability disorder, specific learning disorders, some impulse control disorders like ADHD, and uh, some social and interaction disorders like autism. Next. We seem to have lost her. Wow. Kindly bear with us as we try to get her back on board. Today, technology seems to be a real big challenge. And every time we have a hitch, Dr. Liz Kaimba, I'm sorry, I'll just be uh, calling on you to, to fill in a bit. Um, okay, um, yeah. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, we're talking about two very different issues. Well, two similar but different issues because me, I'm talking about uh, more from the psychological impact um, of, of COVID so far or the mental health impact, um, what has happened so far. So, um, and I, lastly, I was talking about um, the phase where we are at now, uh, where we are trying to regroup and um, recoup all the things that we have lost. Uh, the school year, we have lost some of the milestones, especially for children with mental health issues, we, with um, um, developmental issues, with uh, neurodevelopmental issues. Um, some of the things that they learn at school, which uh, they do not uh, necessarily have at home. Um, some of the, of course, the milestones they had made, which they have now lost, um, and, and um, the mental health issues they may have picked. And uh, when I say that, I don't only mean that uh, there are negative effects, there may also be positive effects in some children, but we also realize that um, these children, because of their unique um, issues, they may, some of them may have a bit of a problem, especially as they get into adolescence uh, or the, the, the higher age, the upper ages, you find that some of them may actually have issues with uh, social, social relations, uh, making friends, uh, etc. And some of these uh, may have been lost. And this, of course, will lead to some uh, mental health issues um, later or um, difficulty with the re-establishing some of these um, relationships, yeah. Um, also we'll find from the medical uh, perspective, some will have difficulty again re-establishing um, the lost treatment. Uh, now that um, we found that during the pandemic, a lot of uh, 
the medical staff, um, some of them were taken to um, handle the more um, immediate need, which was, was COVID, and were not available to, to work with the children. And not only that, the fact that the hospitals were, and most, uh, several still remain um, closed to, to the public except for emergencies. And uh, the fact that also these children were not receiving uh, the normal care, for example, the children who receive physiotherapy, who receive massage therapy, um, ETC, because of the lockdown and uh, social distancing and uh, the stay at home measures that were put in place, you find that um, these children no longer are able to, were able to access these services. And of course, there will be some regression um, on the part of their, their, their treatment. So um, we also find that during the, this acute phase, you remember the acute phase of the pandemic was when all measures were put in place and everything got locked down. Um, we said already that um, there may have been um, some domestic violence, some child maltreatment. Remember these are children, uh, a lot of them don't necessarily stay at home. Um, they go to school or they go to care where um, they are cared for by by um, a specialist who know and who appreciate um, their specific needs. So again, we find that um, they ended up maybe staying home and um, did not get any of this care, did not um, and may have been exposed to um, all sorts of maltreatment. So this will obviously uh, need to be worked worked on. Um, Dr. Gitao, has she come back? No, no, she's not okay. back, but if you don't feel pressured, if you're through, you let her. <laughs> no, well, so um, what's from the psychological perspective or the mental health perspective, which is what uh, I'm comfortable to handle, we find that um, there may be prevalence of um, psychiatric disorders, including anxiety disorders. Um, depression, some post uh, PTSD, even suicidality, because we, we, we have to know that a lot of these children are otherwise mentally healthy children. They are not children necessarily with an existing mental health um, issue. So um, some of them may, might pick, might actually pick, uh, pick up these um, uh, mental health issues along the way. Um, uh, I, I, I believe we can still mitigate for this, even as the children are at home, especially now that the, uh, the outside started opening. Um, we can now slowly reintroduce them back to, reintroduce these children, our children back to, back to care. We can get um, the specialists that they previously worked with to come back and continue working with them, even if it's at home. Um, right now, um, the, hospi the hospitals are also a, a little bit more accessible and um, occupational therapy, for example, those children who are going through uh, speech therapy and other therapies, uh, we'll find that some of those are now available either for home visits or for hospital visits. Um, also, learning, um, as we move on um, day by day, we are coming up with new methods and uh, some teachers are being very creative and are coming up with uh, methods of, of teaching. Um, even these uh, children who might, uh, some of them as uh, Dr. Ari said before, who might be having intellectual um, difficulty disorders and, uh, or just physical disorders or disabilities. So um, it is good now to ask around and um, and, and find out what services may be available. So we, we uh, reintroduce them or we re, re, reinstate these and other maybe social um, services that there may be. Um, we can also now maybe start as we are allowed to gather into smaller and smaller groups, getting some sort of support, um, support groups or um, or even small groups, small learning groups uh, for these children. 
So it's it's not all lost. It's been a tough few months, but things are kind of getting back to normal. So um, I will take it back to to Dr. Gitau and or Dr. Koba, who will take over from me. Um, it seems we lost our main speaker. Dr. Yeah, so this is going to be very interesting, but we'll keep discussing. I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Yes. Yes, I think where we were at, yeah, as Dr. Doc was trying to go on, and she said that um, there's a goal to child rearing. As we wake up every day to take care of our children, one of the things we want to do is get optimal growth from our children. And, and that's why we struggle to make sure that the outcome is positive. We want them to have an effective emotional uh, thinking, planning abilities, as would be called cognitive ability. We also want our children to have proper behavior. That's why we wake up and struggle. Sometimes we talk to them when they have gone wrong. We also want them as they grow up to have a capacity for meaningful occupation occupational participation. So that whether it is school or even as they grow older, they will be able to engage in some form of activity that can give them food and give their families as it were. We want our children to be able to engage in satisfying relationships, whether it's now as they grow up or even as they in the family, in the neighborhood, as they interact with other people. We don't want a child where, as a parent, every morning you're called to be told your child did. Then as you rest, you, you're called by the school and you're told. Even she also pinched this one. Our aim is that they'll be able to relate with people because we know the way they relate now is likely to have a bearing on the way they relate with others in life. We also want them to be able to enjoy when you take them to swing or whatever it is, recreational experiences you want them to have. You, the aim of every parent is that the child will be able to enjoy this. The other thing that's very important is that the child would be able to adapt to the challenges within their environment. You see, we all would like to have a child who has everything, has great friends in the neighborhood, but sometimes that doesn't happen. But a child, whether they move from city, the city life and move to the village or vice versa, should be able to fit in very well without feeling extremely distressed. Very, very important. We can move on to the, to the next slide, Mitao. That, that is a, these are the goals of each parent. And when you're dealing with children who have neurodevelopmental disorders, then there comes a challenge that sometimes when a parent would have wished that all this happens in a relatively easy way, and, and children, childbearing, a normal childbearing, somehow they grow, they adapt, it's easier, but it's not always true for children who have neurodevelopmental issues. Why? Because some, sometimes they have physical issues that interfere with their ability to relate well, their ability to adapt well to changes. Sometimes uh, they, in a new environment, they are not able to notice that we now have a new house girl, or now we have moved from town life where we had a toilet and now have to sit on the latrine. So the adapting that we are talking about becomes a bit uh, difficult. Then the, the way they express their emotions, whether it's excitement or sadness, can also be a challenge for children with, with neurodevelopmental disorders. And we see usually children as they grow up, we expect that around two, three years, they'll have temper tantrums and they can be easily provoked and really do interesting things. However, we see that for children who have neurodevelopmental issues, even when they have, you would have expected that they have grown a bit older and they should have known how to react, that doesn't always happen. And so we'll have like a continuation, if you are to call it that way, of temper tantrums or, or extreme emotional outbursts. Then there, there is the concept of culture and ethnicity. And, and we expect that children would adapt to, if, if we say where we come from in Western Kenya, a, a, a child will probably bend a bit and put one arm on the other as they shake the hand of an elderly person. Would you expect the same? of a child who has neurodevelopmental issues, do they even understand? And will this grandfather who notices that this child did not uh, do as is expected, uh, do the, does the grandfather 
understand that or will they also throw a tantrum and say, you see, this child is not well brought up. So those are some of the challenges of, of dealing with children who have not developed appropriately as expected for age. Next slide. And, and then the other thing is family relationships. And, and, and anyone who's been seeing children with neurodevelopmental disorders will, will really understand what we are talking about. And, and every day we see children where the, the parent, especially when they are not very, very severely affected, like especially if you have something like attention deficit type activity disorder, their families don't all the time understand what's happening to this child. I just, I'm just thinking about a patient I was seeing today. And, and one of the things I told the grandmother who is the one who had brought the child is, you probably are my patient because unless you know how to relate with this child, then this child will never be fine because what you do, the child has ADHD and they keep shouting and they don't understand because this child is all over. The child has ever quite some emotional outburst. The child won't complete any tasks. And, and what they do is they don't understand because they're wondering, all your brothers and sisters seem to be well organized, but you seem to have a problem. And I kept telling them that until you understand and you're able to manage first your emotions and your reaction to this child, then the child will never be well. The family relationships are affected. Socioeconomic status, a well child will complete school on time and be able to go on and, and, and earn their own living. But what happens to children who have neurodevelopmental disorders? This may not be always true for them. And, and modulation of emotions, just relating to the child I was talking about that I was seeing earlier today, and, and the mother keeps saying, they are so angry about everything. And I told them it's because they are unwell. They didn't just wake up one day and decide that I, won't, I don't want to control my mood. It's okay, they are 14 years, and you expect that by now they should have known how to control their mood and not bang the doors. Actually, that was the grandmother. And I have to keep telling her, look, it's because the brain has a little problem. It didn't develop appropriately. Then those are so those are some of the things. They are not able to manage their own emotions as you'd expect. You expect a 14-year-old, for example, a 12-year-old, would the superego has developed, so they know how people should be treated and they know how to behave right. But that's not always true for patients who have and neurodevelopmental issues. And, and if someone sees Dr. Asha, she can keep going, as, but we can move on to the next slide. So what are um, the effects of this? <laughs> Talk you around. Uh, yeah, let's see how long that lasts. <laughs> we'll keep going I hope this last at, until the end of it. Oh, please welcome. Yeah, let, let me try. So uh, thank you, Doc. Thank you so much. Welcome. Um, can you people hear me all I'm off again? Yes, I can hear you, Doc. You can go on. I believe okay. you are yeah. So most developmental disabilities that start in childhood as ex Oh, okay. So as, as I'm going to, to continue from where we've left. So effects of um, neurodevelopmental disability. Um, as we all know, as you, we, 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 we understand, when something starts very early in life, it's definitely going to impact a lot of the individual's ability to function. And Many theories have been postulated as to what usually happens until we get the developmental problems. So a lot of times it is a, a, usually an interaction of gene and environment. And that is because we can clearly see that these disorders many times will usually run in a family or there will be prior history in a family. And sometimes there is no such history. So it means that there's something in the environment, there's also something genetic that uh, leads to these uh, disorders. And also it means that when the genes and environment interact, they're going to have an impact on the outcome, on the phenotype, on the person we see, on the child that we are going to, to be having to deal with. For example, um, a child may be born with slight intellectual disability. And then the environment in which they are born into has no good nutrition, they're not exposed to learning uh, opportunities, this child is going to present with much more intellectual disability than if the same, same child with the same, same genetics had been um, 
provided better learning opportunity, all had better nutrition because uh, the environment and the genetic makeup of this individual interact. Uh, then it is a two-way traffic. So you have a disorder that affects a person's ability to adjust into their environment, which then in turn affect uh, the person, the, the environment. Then the environment makes this person even worse. For example, let's talk about schooling. Most schools don't have special uh, provision for children with uh, physical or mental disability. So when this child goes to school, they're not going to get that opportunity to learn at their own pace. So it means they'll develop then poor self-esteem, for example, or they won't learn the things as they should. They will not have the opportunity to learn. And in turn, then they will, they will lose even uh, another opportunity that they would have had to doing something better because the, already the environment does not uh, provide that opportunity. And therefore, overall acquisition of skill and these children will have behavioral problems because first of all, we've said, so they learn other coping mechanisms. For example, if they are bullied at school, they might become bullies themselves or they may develop anxiety because of the bullying that happens. It is very, very imperative therefore that problems with development are discovered early and that treatment is begun early to reduce all those impacts that happens uh, in these children. And we all know that children can be resilient. So we need to find the factors that will allow children to have resilience and also to mitigate risk factors that may influence these children's uh, mental health as adults. Next, please. I have moved the slide. Thank you. So some sources of resilience include children, the higher the intelligence, the better the performance of the child, even temperament. Even temperament just means a child that is easier to deal with. So people will like to interact and help a child that has a, an even or a stable temperament rather than labile temperament. Children who are very emotional on extremes, tend, people tend to get tired quickly so if a child has a good temperament then physical attractiveness it is a human thing <laughs> i don't want to go into the details but definitely attractiveness of the child physically special skills and abilities a child with artistic skills a child who can uh, say for example sing a child who can play uh, 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 football they tend to be more attractive so even if they are not very intelligent and can do these things they are more likely to be uh, accepted by people they are, they are more likely to be given more opportunities the commitment of caregiver this is what Dr. was saying just as i was coming in about the parents and the caregiver understanding the child and being able to help the child through if the parents and the caregivers are not committed then it is very very difficult to help a child remember it's a minor they rely on somebody else and of course those caregivers must have society support and their family support if you don't if they don't get that then they're not strong enough to be able to support these children next Some of the risk factors that we have that may interfere or that might deter children with de developmental disabilities from moving forward or from achieving their highest potential include poverty. And we all know what poverty translates into. It, it translates to poor resources, poor opportunities. It includes things like nutrition, poor nutrition, 
uh, education opportunities, special education opportunities, then we all know that when people move, it takes time to adjust. And just like the adults in the family, children will also have uh, problems with moving. If you move into a place that has, say, for example, uh, a sort of discrimination in terms of if you move, say, for example, they were all Christian, they moved into a, a majority, maybe another religious group. There might be discrimination for this child and it takes time to adjust. That will bring uh, backward or will delay the achievement of potential by these children. When there is marital and uh, parental conflict, things like divorce, things like separation, family violence, abuse and neglect, even community disruption like the post-election violence. It means the child is uprooted from what they know, from what they were going on. They might even be moved from their usual school, from their usual support. And of course, we have poor resource availability. This is a major thing because, for example, if a child is referred for speech therapy, for example, because of dyslexia, where do you send them, for example? Most, most uh, places have no this uh, specialized occupational therapist. We, we only, for example, have two in MTR. Seem to have lost our speaker again. Dr. Koba, maybe can take over. Should I keep yeah. going? Kindly due to <laughs> time. Yeah, yeah. time yes. is. Yes, Dr. continue. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can move on to the next slide. So there are various types of neurodevelopmental disorders, as many of us would know. And one of it is the mm -hmm. autistic spectrum disorders and um, I don't know whether there's a slide that describes it but in summary what we deal with in autistic spectrum disorders these are children who might be born normally but around three years of age that's around the time you notice specifically that this child has clear delay in speech so we call it the autistic triad where the child will have challenges with speech and it can be totally no speech or it can be some speech that is not appropriate for age, then they have some degree, which is again a spectrum of challenges in social interaction. So there are children who totally will not even play with peers, but there are others who will be able to play, but to a limited degree. And the other important characteristic is a repetitive behavior. And again, it varies for different children. There are children who will have very, very clear head banging, but the others will just have probably a small sound that they produce. So that those are the autistic spectrum disorders and we've seen why it's currently called the spectrum is because there are children who will be highly functioning so that some of them may even manage to go to normal schools and you may never notice to the severe ones who may not may never manage to go even to a usual school then we have the intellectual disability in which was formerly referred to the mental retardation. And the point here is that the child is not able to achieve uh, simple things like even uh, problem solving. I need to go to the toilet. Where would the toilet be? And it depends again on the severity of the illness. There are some children who will actually manage, they'll have struggles and we may not have noticed this, especially if we went to a general public school where you noticed a certain girl at some point, she's in class six, she'd have menses, but she'll never know how to manage them. And she'll always be struggling to be in school, but she somehow managed to leave. So that would be like a mild intellectual disability to the severe ones who hardly can even go to school. Then there are specific learning disorders. There are children who have difficulties with reading, others with um, writing, others will have problem with um, uh, even maths. 
specifically so that the numbers uh, are the main problem. So, the, and then there are language disorders where they may not be able to, to speak, to articulate appropriately. And then there's a common one, the attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, where the child has significant attention deficit. So that when they sit in class, after a few minutes, they want to get up and, and, and go to the toilet continuously. They can't wait in a line. And then there's a hyperactivity, again, where they have excess activity for age. Next. And uh, the, the question then, now that there's all these the neurodevelopmental disorders, they allow our children and then we thank God for them. What do we do so that, especially during such times, we're able to deal with them? And, and it's not easy, like I had said earlier, the most important thing is to recognize early that the child is having difficulties. Very, very important because you notice that when interventions are given early, then the child's outcome, especially those who are not severely affected, tends to be better. So it's important that when you recognize a child, and especially as parents, you will notice that the child would probably should have spoken one word by the time they are one year. And you notice it's one year down the line and the child has not even attempted, then two years. And you keep hoping that they will talk. Most likely if two years a child has not, or is not attempting to speak one or two words, it's likely to be a problem. And we've seen people who have delayed and we see them in the clinic. You are seeing the child at 10 years and you try to understand what has been happening, happening the last 10 years. So the, and the parent says, I have been waiting. I've still been hoping that the child will talk. So very important that assessment is done early. Then schooling is very, very important. And initially we, we, we say that as much as possible, children should be taken, especially like the autistic ones, should be taken to a normal school initially. Why a normal school? For stimulation. But then because they may not sustain the calculus and the complicated stuff of our system, later on they may be taken to special school. But there are children who are severely affected who may need the school, uh, special school earlier on. Speech therapies, again, of course, they are not uh, available as much, but as much as possible, if it's available, speech therapy can help for children, especially who have autistic and the language disorders. And of course, looking at other comorbid physical conditions, some of these children have cerebral palsy. We have seen a lot of comorbidity with epilepsy, so that most of these children will need also to be treated for seizures, because if you don't treat the seizures, then the development is even affected much more. Then other, the other important thing is parental support it is not easy it is always challenging to bring up a child two year we always call them terrible too because they are always all over and they really stretch us now there's a child whose te temperament is a bit uh, not the usual one who gets temper tantrums that are difficult to control who just sit still it is not easy so it's very important to remember that those parents go through a lot of uh, a very hard time. And for us as healthcare workers and as sisters and whoever it is, the most important thing we can give is support to these people. Very, very important that we support them. And, and wherever possible, if you have such a child, sometimes interacting with people who go through what you're going through, parents who have a similar child who understand you is very, very important. And the other important thing is to manage expectations because people come and, and if you've seen people doing what we call doctor shopping or psychology shopping because they are waiting for a miracle. And the one thing that you keep reminding them, and I always give them this example, if you're born with a short limb, the most we could do, we could make a prosthesis, but there's nothing as a doctor I can do to prolong that limb. That is the example I always give to the parents so that they understand what we are talking about. That it is not, we are not saying it's done, but we are saying we need to support them, but we don't have uh, solutions. In, we are talking about managing expectations. We don't have answers to the speech challenges, to the temperament, all the temperament challenges. We will give medication to calm them down, but sometimes it's not always possible medically. Next. Then as, as we continue, the other things are very important things that may not all the time cost money, environment modification and manipulation, creating and maintaining daily routines. And these are possible, whether it's a high end family or they are a low end family, it's very, very important that there is some routine. Most children with neurodevelopmental issues want some form of sameness and they have a problem with disruption. So when you try to maintain some routine, they try to get comfortable. Then if you have to introduce new, new things, it has to be done gradually. Not change the time of eating, change the house, change the house girl. You, when you change so much, they get overwhelmed because they have problems with the learning. Very, very important. You create a variety of play and learning activities from buying toys to out 
outside playing and if you have the resources taking them to different environments that have even different resources that can help these children very very important then most of them will have problems with sensations and some of them can even be irritated a child with uh, some of them we've seen like autistic they have problems with what we call sensory integration so that even just putting clothes on them they can just shout and be very uncomfortable so they were they are taught what we call multisensory teaching and and identifying what the strength and difficulties are very very important tasks as they grow older of course you want to teach them complex tasks because you want them to keep graduating they can't remain as children and what you want to do is to break down a uh, task into small one if it's dressing you don't expect that they will learn how to button the shirt put on the trouser you can begin by just learning even how to maybe put on the trouser for example so you break down the task of dressing into simple simple steps and then you always we do what we call positive reinforcement when the child you taught them yesterday how to put on the trouser or whatever it is the complex task you you did you you did teach them you clap for them when they manage to do it today or if it's temper tantrums and you've been teaching them how to express their mood not in a very exaggerated manner especially for the older children and today they've just managed to be irritated but they didn't shout or they did it differently again you you congratulate them you let them know that you have noticed minimize confrontation we call it expressed emotions these children hate excess criticism or over protection you know when we talked about we talk about express emotions it's not just shouting it's also protecting them no they are still a baby they can't manage so it's very very important that you teach them but avoid when they have done something that's really off you are not shouting because they're not most of them are not able to control their mood as well but you're also giving them an opportunity to explore not saying no they can't because they're not able to so whether it's excess criticism or it's um, over protection all those things are not good for them and and it's very very important that you keep setting realistic goals for them for you and for themselves i know there's a lot of pressure especially from the society and you know that puts pressure on us and we can also put pressure on our children very important that you keep it realistic what they can achieve over how long is different and is dependent on each child next slide and, and as we continue, very important to allow extra learning. Actually, children with neurodevelopmental disorders are probably the only ones who would benefit from what we call remedial classes. Most normal children will, will just be fine with the usual eight to three o'clock classes, but children who have either intellectual disability or all these other things, these ones can benefit from remedial classes. Um, just go back to the patient I was talking to today, and I was very happy to hear that they have brought a teacher and for the first time they can see the handwriting improving. This is very, very important to, for you to notice that, especially in public institutions where there are 70 children, and we thank God for our teachers, but sometimes they are not able to pay attention to your, the needs of a child who has neurodevelopmental issues. So they may need extra learning time and opportunities. They are the only ones who we should be paying for tuition, for example. You ensure that they sleep so that they rest well, then uh, it's very important that you, there's room for adequate interaction with other children, especially who have higher uh, capabilities so that they learn from them and maintain consistency and structure. Very, very important. I know it's not common for most of our families. You want to eat whatever time or read the Bible, whatever time you get time. But it's good to remember if you have a child with neurodevelopmental issues, the more consistent you are in whatever you do, whether it's timing of activities or in rewarding or when something good is done, the better for them. That way they are able to grasp whatever needs to be done. Next. So in summary, what, what we are saying is that we, we don't choose what kind of children we get. And, and we, we, we are very happy when we get children who are all functional and by three, four years, they are out there and they don't need you. But in the event that we get these neurodevelopmental children, we must know children with neurodevelopmental issues. It is good to remember that they too are human and they have something to offer. They may not become your engineer that you have in mind, but they have a right to, to live as it were, and they should live uh, in the best way possible despite the challenges that they have. Very, very important to, to keep remembering that and that interventions are necessary, especially so that we can 
maximize their potential. We've seen autistic children who can draw amazingly or see, play piano or, or make beads. So most of the time, and this is what we tell parents, is something this child, when they, they came, they may never become the doctor or the nurse, but there's something that they can do. Are you able to identify or even play football or whatever it is that they can do? So very, very important for you as a parent or as a relative or as a healthcare worker to be part of the people who help identify whatever it is that this child, the potential for this child so that they can live a fulfilling life and that consistency and structure is the message. Whatever it is that you, ha you, you, you have to do, there must be consistency, there must be structure, not doing things as you go along for the other children because they have difficulty in learning, but the more consistent it is, the easier for them to cope with it. So I hope I have been able to present the content well. <laughs> I hope Dr. Florence is back, but yeah, I think we can take the next session from there. Thank you so much, Dr. Ari. <laughs> it seems to be holding now. At least you'll have time to discuss. Dr. Gitaro, back to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Koba, for stepping in and uh, doing justice to the presentation. And thank you, Dr. Felicita, you, you prepared slides that we could follow. Uh, we are very grateful for that presentation. And now, uh, We'll just ask uh, Liz if you have anything to just summarize on what you were telling us earlier, because we kept interrupting you, and so that we can move on to the question and answer session. Um, I I think I presented my bit before. Um, mine was actually to just talk about the mental health issues that um, have affected these children uh, throughout this COVID period. And um, from the slides as uh, presented by Dr. Koba and Dr. Felicita, we can see that um, uh, during this period, there could have been some stressors. These children could have been exposed to, to violence. Uh, they could have been exposed to very loving families, at least having also um, an opportunity for the parents to get to know them better like all other children. And um, as Dr. Koba just said, these are children just like any other child. Um, we, they deserve um, to live a, a life just like any other child and receive care just like any other child. So we are hoping as we get through this period of the pandemic that, uh, and, and school starts that their lives go back uh, as normal. What I would say is if you do notice that your child uh, has developed some issues then this is important to pick up now and address um, uh, as early as possible. And I, I think um, uh, uh, the presentation was quite um, helpful and adequate for, for, for uh, in talking about these children who have neurodevelopmental issues. Thank you, Dr. Catherine. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Liz. Um, there's one question that, uh, that has, is on the chat, or is it in the Q&A, uh, which says, I have noticed my child forgetting things taught previously before schools closed. Is this normal following the prolonged closure? Um, I'll ask Dr. Felicita if you're still here with us. Could you respond to that? Is she still here? Yes, uh, I'm here. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't see the question. Where is it? In the Q&A session, I can read okay. it again for you. I have noticed my child forgetting things taught previously before schools closed. Is this normal following the prolonged closure? Um. Well, it would, it would depend with what kind of things the child is forgetting. If there were just new items uh, or new concepts that had just been introduced and had not been consolidated, then it, it would be normal to forget because they're not using the concepts. For example, uh, math has concepts like body mass, for example. So first they introduce the concept, then you do practice 
exercises to consolidate the use of concept in different contexts. That is how learning occurs. So repeated use of the concept then consolidates the memory of using that concept. So if the child had just learned a, a new thing, for example, uh, then they are likely to forget it if it had not been consolidated. The other reason for forgetting is children with attention and concentration problems. But then for that to be diagnosed as a problem, it has to have occurred in two different contexts. For example, they also forget things that they've been taught at home, and then they forget things they've been taught at school, or they forget things that have been taught in another context that is not school. But uh, just having difficulties in one context is not enough to diagnose a developmental um, attention and, uh, and concentration disorder like ADHD, for example. I hope I've answered the question. I believe you have, and thank you very much. Um, I don't have too many questions today, and uh, I'm thankful for that because uh, we have uh, really gone past our time. But I'll ask uh, Dr. Somba if you have any comment, you could uh, make a comment before we end this session. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, hope you can hear me. Liz? Uh, yes. Um, Gitao, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? you can. Oh, I can okay. hear you. Yes, no. I uh, hope you had a good day and I must uh, uh, compliment the, the presentation that we got. I think it was wonderful and you must have gotten a lot out of this. Um, uh, some of the, the my, my, my only take on this is that uh, some, sometimes we even miss some of these conditions, especially the ADHD. Um, even as far as we miss them, and maybe, and also the, the issue of um, inheritance. I think it was mentioned sometimes the gene and the environment uh, as a cause of, of uh, these neuro uh, development uh, disorders. Um, I wonder, there's an African feeling that of saying that uh, somebody is born. I mean, uh, a child is, uh, the behavior is born of another grandfather or something like that. I don't know how we can tell it in science. Is it, uh, maybe somebody can advise me on that. Uh, that you behave like your great grandfather or uh, somebody saying that there's some curse of some old generation is come to this child. Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe I think uh, the doctor can uh, advise me on that. But more so, let, 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 let me just end by appreciating everybody. It was a wonderful presentation. And I think you have gained a lot as doctors, especially in this time of a uh, very difficult time. And uh, we can be able to advise our patients and uh, our people come to us well. And with that, let me say good night and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Somba. A very interesting question you have brought up. Um, is it a curse or is it genetics? Uh, yes. Dr. Koba, would you? like to respond to that as you also respond to another question that has come on the chat what diet can we advise to give uh, to these who have neurodevelopmental disorders i am not sure i'm a diet expert here yeah? but what i will encourage is must be healthy diet i think healthy balanced diet you will read and you will see stuff about red beans, beta, the, the carrots and beta carotenes, things like that. But I think what we promote is really a healthy diet. But I would like to hear whether Felicita Mwangi came across anything that's specific to diet for these children. The question of whether it's a curse or genetics, I, I always ask, is diabetes a curse or genetics? The way we look at physical disorders is the same way we must look at these other disorders. You can develop anything from a short limb to a brain that's not developing well. If you think about all medical problems from a 
a car's point of view, then I accept that you look at neurodevelopment from disorders from that aspect. But if you think there are real diseases that a limb can be affected and you limb, then it's in the same way you must look at brain disorders as illness like any other. But we know there's a lot of stigma, not just for neurodevelopmental issues, but even for generally mental health issues. The moment you have anything that presents with behavioral problems, contrary to what is expected, people start looking for, what did you take enough cows if you come from where I come from? Or what did the great grandfather say? Or did who did do what? And we see a lot of that even amongst our patients so that many times someone will say but maybe there's something we don't know including today i was just doing a water round and there's a husband who wanted to carry the wife because they believe uh, the explanation to her presentation is not illness so for neurodevelopmental disorders and all mental illness unfortunately there is that way of looking at it but it's our business as healthcare workers to destigmatize the concept and let people know you can be born with a short limb you can be born with a brain that doesn't develop normally it's not a curse it's it's the way of nature and all we need to do is support the same way you support a child who has a short limb thank you maybe dr mwangi can tell us a little about the diet uh, <laughs> yes there is a lot of speculations on diet uh, and uh, we are what we eat as it were but there are no specific diets for neurodevelopmental disorders however with ADHD, it has been shown that things that contain specifically sorbitol, and sorbitol is used in preserving most preserved foods, like you find in supermarkets, tend to worsen the hyperactivity. Uh, some studies also have been done. This is for those who like the intellectuals. Uh, in, the, in the Asian uh, country, they are currently carrying out very uh, detailed studies on things that contain omega-3 fatty acid and omega-6 fatty acids. And some of these things that have been recommended include um, fish oil and the fish itself. The fish skin contain a lot of these omega-3 and omega-6 oils that are thought to help the, the nerve cells to function better. But these are things that people are speculating so what I would say personally is that a balanced diet from the very uh, early development to adulthood is very, very essential for normal development, rather than speculating on whether we should eat this or we should eat that. But there are those studies, if you Google, you will see some of those studies recommending some of those foods like fish and omega-3 fatty acids. Thank you very much, Dr. Mwangi. Uh, we also got a comment from Dr. Kingi Muchache, who says uh, similarity in behavior to a relative might just be genetic makeup. ADHD has 80% genetic predisposition. Thank you very much, Dr. Kingi, for your contribution. Um, and now I think we shall close uh, this webinar for this evening. I thank you all who have participated uh, and thank you our presenter for the very good presentation despite the hitches that we have had. Um, thank you Liz Kaemba for uh, giving us uh, some ideas on how we can manage uh, children who have these disabilities and uh, we look forward to hearing more from you in future webinars. And thank you for stepping in whenever we called for you to step in. And yeah, I would uh, request maybe uh, Dr. Igondu, if he's still here, if he can close for us. I'm not sure if he's still here. Mm, okay, I can't see him. Dr. Kitulu, do you mind closing for us uh, the webinar this evening? Sorry for the ambush. Okay. Dr. Kitulu, I'm not sure if you can unmute her mic and just say something before we leave. Mm -hmm. OK. 
Okay. Okay, Dr. Haas, kindly tell us, uh, close for us the meeting. Um, thank you so much, of course, to our uh, presenters, uh, to our panelists, our participants, and of course to you, our moderator, Dr. Gitau. This has been uh, a very interesting and very well done uh, webinar. <laughs> we have really fired forth and done a good job. Thank you so much. Uh, so I think without uh, further ado, I would like to, to reiterate and say thank you again uh, and a good evening to everyone. Uh, see you all next week on Tuesday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.